Okay, welcome to today's episode. I got something. This is, um, how do I say this? This is not, this is more intense stuff. This is for people who like to exercise their brain. So some of my podcasts are, you know, for everybody, for beginners, and this one's not. It is and it isn't. So if you're a beginner, you can still listen, but this is for, I get people who follow me that are further down the path of life in terms of like what they're accomplishing and they want to be more intellectually challenged. And so I was talking to, to one of my buddies um, who actually is the founder of, of MySpace, Tom, co- co-founder. You probably remember him, Tom at MySpace. And I, I sent him a WhatsApp this morning and I said, the greatest thinker of our time. And uh, we got in a little debate. He thinks he has another philosopher that he likes better. But uh, I said, you know, Will Durant, if, if you're listening to this and you have not read or studied Will Durant, all I could say is the real societal shame is not the Kardashians and not that people spend too much time on their phone. The real crying shame is you and I went through 18 years or 12 years or however long you went to school, whether it be public, private, college, paid, free, charter, homeschool, and nobody ever sat us down for serious hours of our life and said, study the most genius person possibly of our time. I've read a lot of the classics. I've read most of them. I've read the smartest thinkers. And Will Durant and his wife, Will and Ariel Durant, um, they, wrote a, they wrote a series of books that's very small. It's four million words and about 10,000 pages. And it's insanely intelligent. And what I like about them, because there's been many great thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci and, you know, you have Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, you you have the more modern Spinoza and you have um, people of our time like Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. So when you are reading Will Durant, you're reading somebody who's relatively recent, not that recent. He's been dead for decades, but but he, you know, he's not from the 1700s. So a lot of his stuff is relevant to our time. And what's interesting, he made all these predictions about what the world will be like. And so I want to read you two. Th- I want to read you and talk about the value in our lives of what Will Durant said about innovation and in society. And then I also want to talk about something called ESS, which is evolutionary stable strategies, which is a more complex concept. It's one of the, it's so powerful of a concept, you probably never heard of it. It's so important that you've never heard of it. And if you walk down the street and ask 1,000 people, do you know what ESS, evolutionary uh, stable strategies mean? 1,000 people will be like, I've never actually heard that phrase before, which is the tragedy upon tragedies because you learn the multiplication tables, which is somewhat helpful. I mean, it is helpful to know 12 times 12 is 144 and 9 times 9 is 81, but... And it is probably, well, it's less important that kids know calculus and pre-calculus because basically unless you go down the sciences or engineering, you don't really use those. And people will argue, well, Ty, but the process of, of brain, the restructuring of the brain that happens as children learn calculus. Well, BS. There's another way to train the brain, and that's by things that not only will reformulate your brain and recalibrate your thinking, but also give you practical, cogent, tangible benefits. So I'm going to read you four pages. I won't read them all, but this comes from, he has a starter book. So he has a book him and his wife wrote. It took him 50 years. It won a Pulitzer Prize, I think in 19, late 1960s, which is the, like the Nobel Prize for books. He was a professor and he studied history. But here's the thing about history. I've talked about this before. One of the great, uh, Ray Dalio, one of the wealthiest men in the world and a hedge fund manager, people say, how do you know what to invest in, in the stock market? And he says, well, I study history because everything repeats itself. So even if you don't care about history and you're like, what does that have to do with today? It has a lot to do with today because cycles generally repeat. There are things that don't repeat. Obviously, you know, there's never been a nuclear age before, but let me read you this. Okay. So. He starts out talking about the great person. He calls it the great man, the hero, or the great woman, the genius. He says he is not quite the God that Carlyle described. 
Okay, so let's say you want you have somebody you look up to, whether it be Elon Musk or your dad or something. He says he's not quite the god that you and I think of. The hero is usually not the god or she. You can replace she. This is before they had gender gender neutral terms, okay? He grows out of his time and land and is the product of symbol of his events. Anyway, I'm going to skip to that's kind of his setup. He says At times, his eloquence, like Winston Churchill's, may be worth a thousand regiments. His foresight in strategy and tactics, like Napoleon, may win battles and campaigns and establish states. If he is a prophet, like Muhammad, wise in the means of inspiring men, his words may raise a poor and disadvantaged people to unpremeditated ambitions and surprising power. He's going through a list of powerful people throughout history. That have changed our lives. He brought up Churchill. Churchill started in early 1900s. He went to war in South Africa. A lot of the problems that have happened in South Africa and still are there go back to Winston Churchill and the Boer War, it was called. Then Winston Churchill kind of messed up World War I. There's a good movie you should see called Gallipoli. What does it have? Who's in that, Zach? Is it Mel Gibson? It's what Mel Gibson's, I think, was his first, first movie. Gallipoli was a battle that Winston Churchill was sure he would win. He was the head of the 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 English admiral, uh, I mean uh, navy, and they messed up. They were fighting the Turks, the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, and he says, and then of course Winston Churchill is part of why Hitler was defeated. We'd all be speaking German probably if Winston Churchill hadn't played a part. He was at least one part of it. And then he talks about Muslim, Islam, the Prophet Muhammad. He calls him. He says if he's a prophet who can inspire men, because whether you agree with one religion, Islam or not, the Prophet Muhammad has inspired people thousands of years later. I mean, look at the world. There's more Muslims, I think, than any other religion. I think Muslim, if you count Malaysia and Indonesia, it's the most. Can you check on that? Maybe Hinduism. I believe Muslim by count is the largest. So one one prophet. So these are the heroes of our time. And you'll see how this is relevant to you and I. Then he talks about Pasteur, Moore, uh, Morse, Edison, Ford, Wright, Marx, Lenin, Mao Zedong are effects of n- numberless causes and the causes of endless effect. So now, here we go. This is the important part. So the imitative majority follows the innovative minority. Write that down if you're taking notes. Islam second. What's first? Buddhism? Hinduism? Christianity's first? Oh, okay. I was wrong. Christianity's first. How close is it? 2.3 billion to 15. 1.6. Okay. So Christianity. Interesting. Okay. I guess with Catholicism. Yeah. So it goes 2.3 billion Christians, 1.6 billion Muslims. But it's a lot. You know? And obviously Christianity came out of one man who was about 2,000 years ago from those teachings. So you can see the power that one person can have in history. And this podcast is really about the power that you can have, that you and I can have, if we understand what makes real heroes. So we talked about, you know, it's the wit, it's the it's the innovation of a, you know, Louis Pasteur or Henry Ford in changing technology. It could be the eloquence of Winston Churchill. He was a great public speaker, right? So he inspired a nation to fight back against the Germans. The new movie Dunkirk is coming out. We might go see it today, right, Zach? We might go see it. Yeah. So, and then Muhammad, of course, changed the world. Prophet Muhammad, Jesus Christ. So, but listen to this. So the imitative majority follows the innovative minority. And that's what we see. Winston Churchill was one, a minority, just one man. And most of society, the majority of people, is imitative. They follow. And a very, 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 very small amount of humanity is it, are innovators. Okay? Now, but history, he says, in the large is the conflict of minorities. See, most wars are two privileged people fighting each other. And then everybody else gets caught in between. 
I mean, if you think about most wars, even World War I, which is the beginning of the wars in the last century, was the first big war in the 1900s was World War I. And um, it was really a whole bunch of leaders that didn't get along. It wasn't the people. The French people didn't want to go get slaughtered. The Americans didn't want to get slaughtered. The English, the Germans, the Russians. You think the average peasant that was a farmer in Russia wanted to go and get slaughtered on the fields of battle in Poland and things like that. My uncle, my great uncle, my grandma's brother was killed in world war two. He, he liked horses. He didn't want to, he, he didn't even know who Hitler was, but he died in the German army fighting Russia. So basically here's the deal throughout history. The average common imitator gets caught up in the conflicts and gets basically used by a minority of people, okay? And you see that in modern society. People talk about how the rich are getting richer. People don't always like Donald Trump. They always talk about Donald Trump and his friends that are the billionaires club and how they get away with stuff. And there's some truth to that. And it's been that way for a long time. So where are we? Are we just left helpless? Well, here's something to understand. And this is gonna lead us into evolutionary stable strategies. The world is set up this way, and it's the natural cycle, and you don't need to freak out. The systems of checks and balances. For example, I'm somewhat of a revolutionary in certain things. Like, I don't like the modern school system. But Will Durant says, remember, out of 100 new ideas, 99 of them are inferior to the traditional responses, which they propose to replace. No one. However brilliant or well-informed can in one lifetime can come in one life to, to so fullness of an understanding as to safely judge and dismiss the customs of institutions of his society. For these are the wisdom of generations after generation. So in the 1960s, revolution. People didn't, they were like free love and, you know, everybody do drugs and free love and forget the Vietnam War. It was a very counterculture in the 1960s and the 1970s, okay? The truth was, and then the older people were like, no, we do need to go to Vietnam. You know, we need to fight communism. And no, free love, if you do it too much, causes societal structure. And so there's this tension of two groups hating each other. You see that right now with Republicans and Democrats. You got the Republicans who are very much free market, no regulations, let things go. Global warming will fix itself by letting companies fix it doing carbon credits, this, and Democratic or liberal versus conservative, liberal people are the other side hating the conservative side and going, you guys are idiots. The truth is you need the checks and balances. And so what he says is he says, so the conservative who resists change is as valuable as the radical who proposes it, perhaps as much, uh, perhaps much more valuable at, because roots are more valuable than graphs. So what he means by that, a root is, you know, a tree where a tree was originally planted. A graft is when you take one part of a tree, you cut a branch off and you, you connect them together. It's almost like, um, it's almost like in a human, like having a bionic arm. And he's saying in society, when there's new crazy innovations, I'll give you a perfect example. Actually, let me, this is a complicated subject, so I'm trying to make it a little simpler. Malcolm X, uh, I just was reading his autobiography. Spike Lee says it's the best book he ever read and changed his life. So Malcolm X in, was a huge revolutionary, okay? And I, I look up to him in many ways. On, in other ways, he was kooky. For example, he believed this guy named, I think his name was Elijah. He followed this one guy who was like 60 years old and literally thought this guy was like God on earth and he was perfect. And then Mah and then Malcolm X, about 10 years into it, realized this guy was a fallible human. Like he was kind of in a cult. Malcolm X woke up to this. If you read the book, you see. So even a great revolutionary makes idiotic choices at times. And so we need checks and balances. If the world would have instantly just accepted everything Malcolm X said 100%, we would have been worshiping a 60-year-old dude who preached that you should never have sex with anyone except your wife, but then Malcolm X found out he slept with like 40 of the girls in his 
in his group. So he was a hypocrite. There's nothing wrong with sleeping with people, but you can't be preaching that it's evil and then you do it. I mean, that's basic hypocrisy 101. So the point being, we needed checks and balance. Certain part of American society did not like Malcolm X and they thought he was crazy. And some of that was racism because a lot of what Malcolm X preached was correct. But at one point, he literally thought white people were devils. Okay? I mean, I don't know how to explain this, but devils don't even exist. So he was a little kooky. If you read some of Gandhi's stuff, he was a little kooky. If you read the Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, these guys are, they're all crazy. But if you let their craziness merge together and you let it balance itself, then you get what you want in the world, which is a well-balanced world. Remember that. The conservative who resists change is as valuable as the radical who proposes it. So the lesson for me was, I'm a revolutionary about the school system, but I need to not be so revolutionary as to hate people who want to have a more traditional approach to education. So the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. If you are a hardcore anti anti Donald Trump person, you're probably missing the true answers. There's pro you probably need some Donald Trump in the world. But on the flip side, if you love Donald Trump so much that you think that Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton is an idiot, then you're an idiot. Because there's, if you read with an open mind, objectively, un, in an unbiased way, you'll find tremendous wisdom in that stuff. And that's, I was talking about this in another podcast, you know, we need Kim Kardashians, but we also need people that are the opposite of Kardashians. You need some people in your life who have a temper. You know how like some people are like, all we need is love. Have you ever been around a hippie group of people that's just all about love, it always falls apart. Read the story of every commune. They all fall apart. But the world probably needs a few people or it, not, it needs people that lean more towards communists. I'm not a communist. I lean more towards capitalism. But I'm open-minded enough to realize that we must, we must, we must make room for the people who are on the opposite side. The conservative who resists change is as valuable as the radical who proposes it. All communists out there should understand that they're radical. And they should believe also and look to the value of people who see, who love capitalism. And this message that I give in this podcast, because this is kind of a recurring theme of my podcast. It's too, it's too hard for people. Because in our brain, there is something that's called the certainty bias. We want certain answers. We don't like the truth. We want to know, okay, this is the truth. Um, capitalism and America is perfect. That's what a lot of Americans think. Or Germans. I was over in Germany, and Germans laugh at Americans and go, oh, you know, Americans are just people who they just do Botox and they care about. I'm like, what are you talking about? Do you really think Germany is superior to America? Because I don't think America is superior to Germany. But they have just as stupid people as we have here. I, I go to Scandinavia, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Iceland. They sometimes, oh, America. Look at how you're all fun. Well, I'm like, yeah, but we produce the most Nobel Prize winners. Don't mock us too much. What you should do, and this is the simplest takeaway from today's podcast, Simplest takeaway is this. Take the best and forget the rest. That's what I do. Look at the Kardashians. Take the best and forget the rest. If you're a marketer, you own a business, you better be watching. the. If you don't follow the Kardashians, you're an idiot. That's what I can tell you. Because they have 100 million Instagram followers. Love it or hate it, you better get used to it. Now, on the flip side, if you only follow the Kardashians, you are also an idiot. So... I follow Kardashians and I read Will Durant. I listen to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And I also read Aristotle. And that's what you got to do. This is the path that makes heroes. If you want to be a hero, if you want to stand out, that is about the only option. Or else you will be, you don't 
do you want to believe like Martin Luther? I mean, sorry, like Malcolm X, that white people came from the, they're from the devil. There are many devils. I mean, that's like Tom and Jerry cartoon shit. But again, you can take the best because Malcolm X had some awesome stuff. The main takeaway from Malcolm X, he had tremendous courage and conviction. And he, when he believed in something, he was able to fulfill it. And very few people can do that. So you know what I do? I read Malcolm X. The part where he says white people as devils, I'm like, okay, that's not the best of, of Malcolm X. So I'm going to leave that part in the book. Spike Lee can get some value from that. I don't believe in devils. So there, it's impossible for a white person to be a devil and what about me i'm a mix of a whole bunch of races am i part devil part i mean it's just it's mind-blowing that was the 1960s people actually believe that i think it's mind-blowing that you believe there was a man who you were following and you thought he was divine i mean do people say people i read a vice article the five places in the world that people still follow somebody who says he's jesus christ i'm like really you there's a place in Russia. Three thousand people have followed this guy, and he thinks he is Jesus. And there's another I forget. There's one in Brazil or Cuba or something. <sighs> if only what I'm talking about in this podcast could have been taught to all humans. So let's talk about evolutionary stable strategy. Let's go a little bit further. For those of you in my sixty-seven steps. This is a little preview into one of the 67 steps, which is understanding ESS. So I'll, I'll get into a little bit, but I will shamelessly plug my 67 steps. If you really want to know this stuff, you see some of the value in this podcast. If you go to my website, tylovers.com, on the top, there's a little nav bar. It says 67 steps. Go there. Now, I know how psychology works. Most people are lazy. Most people procrastinate. Most people say they'll do it and never do. I've had over 120,000 people go through the 67 steps. I've had about 80,000 testimonials written. The other 40,000 that went through it, they didn't really say anything bad. They just, you know, not everybody writes a testimonial. If you were on Amazon.com and you saw a book or an item that had 80,000 people write a positive review, is that enough for you? Sometimes people are like, should I go in the 67 steps? Well, 80,000 people left me a review. That's pretty good. I didn't pay them. I didn't know anything. 67 steps is one of the most powerful things I ever created. And it's amazing. People don't go through it. And it's not because I created it because it's actually a compilation of what I learned from other people with some of my own experience mixed into it. It's very powerful stuff. I use the 67 steps every day to decide life's all about decisions. You make bad decisions, you will have a crappy life and you will be broke. It's about that simple. If you think about life, what is in a decision? You're making a decision to listen to this now. You decide who you marry. You decide what political party to vote for. You decide what career to pursue, what college you or di did or didn't go to. Look through your life. Have those decisions always been well-informed and genius? If you're like me, no. And so the 67 steps is a new way to think about life so that you make less mistakes and you make more good decisions, which lead to health, wealth, love, and happiness. So... Here's what evolutionary stable strategy is. There is, I'm going to give it to you. This was originally came from these two researchers, uh, Maynard Smith and George Price. And I'm going to give you a, a simpler way to understand it. It's called hawks and doves. And let me see if I can find an actual little graph here. It's pretty cool. Okay. So here's how it works. If you, let's pretend hawks are mean birds and doves are nice birds okay and let's say the hawks the mean birds the hawks always take advantage and kind of beat up and cheat on the little nice doves okay so what would happen imagine there was an island out off south america like the galapagos islands and you have those two types of birds the hawks and the doves if, what had happened if you had too many hawks? If you had too many hawks, they would basically take advantage and kill all the doves, right? They would kill all the doves. And this is a very simplistic version. You can read about hawks and doves. I'm trying to, one of my goals from my podcast and all my stuff is to take complicated stuff since 
we live in a busy world and you might be busy and I'm going to try to make it really quick and get it to you. Almost like, you know, book summaries, but this is more philosophy studies. So what happens if you have too many hawks? They kill all the doves and then the hawks die because they have nothing to be a predator for. Hawks need doves. They must have doves. But what happens if there's too many doves? Well, then the sick doves and the weak doves would procreate. And then the dove population will get weaker and weaker. Think about National Geographic. You ever seen Africa? You've got the the big, the gazelle, the wildebeest, and they're running. And then you have cheetahs and lions. And when you see the cheetah and lion, they're brutal. They're mean. And there's not many of them. But what would happen if you said, I don't want to live in a mean world. I want every, I just want nice harmony, like a Disney movie with just gazelle and wildebeest walking around. Well, what would happen is the wildebeest that were weak and sick, okay, would reproduce too much and produce weak offspring. They also would take up the food supply and the healthier, younger wildebeest and antelopes wouldn't get their chance and would die off. So it'd be a, it would be a bad world to live in. It would slowly, they would eat all the grass and there'd be no grass left and then they'd all be extinct. So you need some lions because what do lions and cheetahs eat? They eat the dying and the sick wildebeest. But what would happen if all of a sudden too many lions were born? Too many cheetahs were born. They would start killing too many of the young, healthy, because they now not be enough sick animals to go around. They'd start eating the healthy ones. And then the population will get smaller. And if you study biology, the gr- for the grass to grow, they need huge herds of wildebeest and deer. I'm not going to get into why that is, but it's basically something called hoof effect. The hoofs chip up the soil and they aerate it. So you need big packs of this. So if you don't, the land will turn to desert. It's called desertification. It happened in many places in the world where it turns to desert when you get rid of the, the wildebeest and the gazelles grazing. So too many lions is a disaster, too little lions is a disaster, too many wildebeest is a disaster, and too little wildebeest is a disaster. So what happens is, over time, a perfect tension exists. Just enough lions and just enough innocent wildebeest. On the island, just enough hawks and just enough doves, and it stabilizes. And it never fully stabilizes. There's always a little bit too many of one, and then it swings a few years later to the other. But it's always trying to seek equilibrium or evolutionary stable, uh, an evolutionary stable environment. And that's where ESS comes from. So in society, sometimes you're going to get too many Republicans. For the last eight years in the United States, it's been all Democrat. You've had Obama for eight years. Okay. Now, there's a professor who always predicts, since 1984, he's been able to predict who would be the president. He predicted Donald Trump would win because he said America has had enough of Democratic policies and it's going to swing. And he was right. He predicted it. Donald Trump actually thanked him. He said he's the only guy who got it right early. But this uh, this, uh, professor understands evolutionary stable strategy. He understands that what's going to happen is we had too much Republican. We had George Bush, went to war. Some people love war because they're more hawks, they're more lions, they're more cheetahs. And then we did that for a while. And then all of a sudden people are like, wait a sec, we had a little bit too much of war and they're fed up. So it swings, the evolutionary stable strategy swings over to Obama, who, you know, he we still pursued the war, but he tended to be a little bit less gung-ho, possibly. Um And then after eight years of Obama, people were like, oh, man, enough of this liberal policy. And it swung to Donald Trump. And you mark my words, in the next four to eight years, it's going to swing back around. It always swings. There's never been a time in American history where you've had Democrat, 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 Democrat Democrat, for 20 years. You know, I mean, in recent history, it doesn't happen that way. Okay, so whenever you take an approach to something whether it's investing in real estate, starting your own business, realize you got to find the evolutionary stable strategy. I launched this program called the Social Media Marketing Program. I let in, I think I've trained 10, 20,000 people how to start their own social media marketing agency. Eventually, 
that strategy won't work anymore because too many people will be doing it. So the, it will swing again. There'll be a new opportunity. And that's why what happens in, in business and ec the economy is you have to stay on the cutting edge because what worked before, it shifts and it doesn't work anymore. You see that? Like Hillary Clinton didn't get that. She didn't understand that what worked to get President Obama elected was no longer going to work because the environment had shifted. You got to be adaptable. So you should read up on evolutionary stable strategy. If you're thinking, by the way, another little plug here, uh, of getting into the social media marketing agency, you should do it early. The first guy who got in in the first day, he just was at my house. He made $105,000 last month, and he's 22 now. He didn't have a bank account eight months ago. Now he's on track to make, I think he's on track to net. I'm not sure his net numbers, but he's going to make seven figures. He's going to make a million dollars plus. And I'd say probably half of that is profit. So 600 grand, were you making 600 grand at 22? No, because he understood the shift. He understood that you have to follow people who are innovative. He got in the program. Now, not everybody has that results. He's had the best results. So of the 25,000 people or whatever that got in, you know, because first of all, other people get in 10,000 of them never even open the program because people are so freaking lazy that they don't even use it. So, for you, the takeaways from this talk, and I know it's been kind of a long conversation, but the takeaways, first of all, are understanding that to be a hero, you have to be open-minded and see both sides. Okay, that's, that's a huge takeaway. You have to understand that the radical Malcolm X is just as important, but no more important than the conservative housewife or husband who lives in... Omaha, Nebraska, and just lives in a suburb, you know, and just has a nine to five job. No one's more valuable. They're different. And you need to listen to both sides. And then the last takeaway is that everything is trying to seek to balance itself out. There will be a recession every time the economy heats up. There will be a recession to balance it out. I'm predicting in the next uh, six to 18 months, there'll be a recession. I could be wrong, but I will see. We'll see. The reason I say that is the last recession was 2008, and there was about three years of recovery. Things started to recover, I'd say, around 2011, 2012. It's been heating up ever since. There's been about three, four, five years of things getting hotter, the stock market reaching new peaks. And what is, if we know equal, uh, evolutionary equilibrium or evolutionary stable strategy, we know that that must be counterbalanced to get all the dumb businesses and get all the inflation out. You have to get rid of it. And it's a harsh process and we call it recession and it'll be unemployment. So prepare now. I advise you to build multiple streams of income is by far the best. You can try to build a bunker and stock up food, but I don't think you need that. I mean, it is good to have extra food and water. I do. I'm not a survivalist, but I do. Again, I listen to smart people. There's some smart survivalists. You should have enough water in your basement. Just go to the grocery store and buy 50 jugs of that water. That's like 30 cents cost you, you know, 15, 20 bucks. That's just smart to have water. And, you know, maybe if you believe in guns, buy a gun. So, to, uh, which is another example of evolutionary st stable strategies. Do you want everybody in the world to be a pacifist? Uh, no. Do you want everybody to have guns? Mm, probably not. There's a few kooky. Uh, you wouldn't want everybody. You wouldn't want criminals to have guns, but they have them anyway. But the point being, in an ideal world, you need to balance. So, yeah. The social media marketing program is on my site, tylopez.com. I will see you there. Stay tuned for the next episode. These podcasts bounce around. I'm going to start doing some debates. I'm going to do a debate on uh, vegan versus paleo meat eaters. I might do one Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders lovers versus Trump lovers. That ought to be, that'll be fun. We'll get smart people on both sides. You watch. They're both going to make good points. And you'll be able to make your own decisions. So that's coming soon. I'll probably have some gun rights people versus anti-guns. Um, that high school debate format needs to be revived in the modern world. I'm eating some blueberries. By the way, if you have a choice, always buy wild blueberries. They have like 10 times the ORAC score, which is antioxidants. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Leave me a review. I need those. That's all. I gave you this free. Do me that favor. Thank you.